Sigmoid volvulus is the most common volvulus of the GI tract and you will encounter it when you start work as a junior doctor. It needs definitive management otherwise it can lead to peritonitis and death. As such you need to know about it for your exams and in real life too. So in this tutorial I'm going to teach you what a sigmoid volvulus is, the risk factors for its development, how you should manage them when you are on call and then I'm going to teach you about investigations and further management. This will include a run through of emergency surgery as well as the elective options of resectional and non-resectional surgery for reducing the risk of its recurrence. As you will know, the large bowel is covered by a layer of peritoneum. In areas such as the ascending and descending colon, this layer of peritoneum typically holds the colon in a retroperitoneal position, and so there is no mesentery for these parts of the bowel. In other places, such as the cecum, transverse and sigmoid colon, the peritoneal covering forms a mesentery, meaning these parts of the colon are intraperitoneal and relatively mobile. The mesentery of the sigmoid is known as the sigmoid mesocolon, and if this mesocolon and sigmoid are long enough, then this mesentery and sigmoid can be prone to twisting. If it does twist, then it can result in a closed loop of sigmoid colon. If this happens, peristalsis and other factors may allow one-way passage of proximal colonic contents into this closed loop, and the pressure inside it increases. As the pressure increases, distension will increase, and eventually this luminal pressure may exceed the venous pressure in the wall of the bowel. Vascular compromise occurs, and gangrene and perforation are the results. Vascular occlusion and thrombosis in the mesentery is another way in which bowel ischemia may occur. There are quite distinct geographical differences in the epidemiology of sigmoid volvulus. Notably, sigmoid volvulus in the developing world is more common in younger and fitter patients, whereas in the developed world you will see that most patients are elderly and frail. Worldwide it is more common in men, and patients with sigmoid volvulus often suffer from chronic constipation, as it is believed that in time the sigmoid colon may elongate and become very redundant and floppy, making it prone to twisting. Gut motility disorders and disorders caused by neurological or psychiatric conditions and their associated medications mean that these patients are also at risk of sigmoid volvulus. In pregnancy, an enlarging uterus may trigger volving of a redundant sigmoid colon. If sigmoid volvulus occurs in children, it is usually a result of an underlying condition such as Hirschsprung's disease, chronic constipation and megacolon, to name some examples. The history and examination should focus on 1. making the diagnosis and 2. working out whether or not there is gangrene or frank perforation of the sigmoid colon because this will directly influence your management. It has been estimated that between 10 and 20% of patients with sigmoid volvulus will actually present with gangrene or perforation. So typically, a patient with a sigmoid volvulus complains of a few days of increasing distension together with absolute constipation with or without nausea and vomiting. If your patient is complaining of a lot of abdominal pain, particularly with a history of fever, then this may suggest the development of gangrene or perforation. On examination, here we have our box medicine buddy Johnny. Start with an ABC approach. Is your patient well or unwell? Make your life-saving bedside interventions here by applying oxygen, getting IV access and putting up some IV fluids as important examples. Once you have gone through your ABCs, pay close attention to Johnny's fluid status, the signs that may suggest the diagnosis or its differentials, and again, whether or not there are signs of gangrene or perforation. So from the top, check out Johnny from the end of the bed. Patients with a sigmoid volvulus are typically very distended. Closer up, there may be signs of dehydration and hypovolemia, such as cool peripheries, delayed capillary refill time, and dry mucous membranes. Johnny might even be short of breath, or he may even have a cough if there is respiratory compromise or lower respiratory tract infection, secondary to having a great deal of trouble ventilating against his massively distended abdomen. So do examine the chest. Moving on to Johnny's abdomen, look, then feel. Are there any hernias? particularly in the groin, to suggest an alternative cause of distension, such as an obstructed hernia. Palpate the abdomen and note whether or not there are signs of impending or frank perforation. 
So if the patient is very tender or the signs of peritonism are present, this should definitely ring alarm bells. As I've mentioned in other tutorials, peritonism can be defined clinically as the presence of guarding, percussion tenderness and or rebound tenderness. Percussion of Johnny's distended abdomen will probably sound tympanic, that is, hyper-resonant, due to the large gas-filled loop of sigmoid lying just beneath the anterior abdominal wall. Other signs that should ring alarm bells include the presence of fever, tachycardia and hypotension. OK, so now you'll have an idea of what the diagnosis is likely to be and what the other possibilities are. Now in your exams you get quizzed about specific conditions but in real life patients don't come with their diagnosis written on their forehead so for now you have a patient who has presentation that may fit the diagnosis of a vulvulus which could be sigmoid, sequel or other or it may be a pseudo obstruction which is often the main differential diagnosis for a sigmoid vulvulus as we see this condition in a similar subset of patients. Other differential diagnoses include large bowel obstruction, perhaps secondary to a colonic tumour, or the patient may have small bowel obstruction or an ileus, for which there are many causes. You're still at the bedside, having examined our box medicine buddy Johnny, and as a junior doctor, you now need to consider what I like to call the box medicine six. Six tests that you should at least consider for every patient you clock. First, make sure you know the capillary blood glucose, as an inflammatory response can drive this up, particularly in diabetic patients. And diabetic patients taking antihyperglycemic medication, but otherwise have been unable to eat or drink, risk life-threatening hypoglycemia. It is important to have a baseline ECG during an acute admission. A urine dip may help when considering differential diagnoses and raised inflammatory markers should ring alarm bells as it may suggest gangrene or perforation. Don't forget a coagulation and group and save as your patient might end up going to theatre. A metabolic acidosis or raised lactate should also ring alarm bells. When it comes to x-ray radiographs, an erect chest radiograph might, but might not, reveal the presence of a perforation by demonstrating free air under the diaphragm. A plain abdominal film will make the diagnosis of a sigmoid volvulus about two-thirds of the time. So let's take a look at this. The hallmark of a sigmoid volvulus is the coffee bean sign. This is a double layer of edematous bowel wall, giving the impression of a white line surrounded by air in the closed loop of sigmoid. In a sigmoid volvulus, it will point towards the pelvis and left iliac fossa. If you see it pointing towards the right iliac fossa, then this suggests a possible sequel volvulus. Other signs include loss of haustra due to colonic distension and in this plain abdominal radiograph we can see an air fluid level as the patient is actually lying on his or her side. And this air fluid level lies within the closed loop of sigmoid demonstrated here by a coffee bean sign which again is pointing to the left iliac fossa suggesting it is a sigmoid volvulus. Okay that's our box medicine six. How else can we investigate our patient with a sigmoid volvulus? This depends on whether we still have questions that need answering, namely one, are we happy with the diagnosis, and two, are we confident that there isn't bowel wall ischemia or perforation. Now, if I'm happy with the diagnosis and the patient is well and my alarm bells aren't ringing, I might not need any further investigations, but if I'm not sure of the diagnosis or I want more evidence that there's no ischemia or perforation, then I need a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. In the textbooks, you might read about barium enemas but they're not that common since there is a chance that the added pressure may cause a perforation and if the barium gets into the peritoneal cavity then it can cause peritonitis. And basically with CT these days there's very little need for a barium enema. Management of a patient with sigmoid volvulus involves at least two of the following three phases. The first is always resuscitation, the second is sigmoidoscopy, and the third is emergency laparotomy and sigmoid colectomy. Resuscitation involves those basic interventions we already mentioned, so oxygen and IV fluids, making sure the patient is well filled and stabilized, and also considering a urinary catheter to ensure adequate renal perfusion. In addition to resuscitation, I'll actually mention here a nasogastric tube in a distended patient can be placed to try to reduce the risk of aspiration. Now, after you have resuscitated your patient, let's pretend that he or she has no pain or tenderness, is afebrile, and the inflammatory markers are normal. Here it sounds reasonable to attempt to decompress and reduce the vulvulus sigmoidoscopically, which is phase two. 
and this should be done as quickly as possible. Now, since the point of torsion is often about 15 centimeters from the anal verge, it might be within reach of a rigid sigmoidoscopy. Now, this can be done at the bedside and may achieve decompression and reduction of the volvulus. Otherwise, a flexible sigmoidoscopy should be performed, which can be successful in up to 90% of cases. Whether rigid or flexible sigmoidoscopy is performed, if successful, a rectal tube for two or three days can help to further decompress the abdomen over this time. A rectal tube may also serve as a temporizing measure, for example, while the patient is being teed up for definitive surgery. Now, do bear in mind the risks of sigmoidoscopy, which include perforation, and also the risk of reducing bowel that is already gangrenous. But what if sigmoidoscopy just doesn't work? In this case, your patient should go on to have a laparotomy and have the sigmoid colon excised as soon as possible, and that's phase three. Okay, let's rewind to pretend our patient on initial assessment was actually very tender, febrile, and had a CRP of 400 and a lactate of six. How would you deal with this? First, again, resuscitate, but rather than sigmoidoscopy, this patient needs to go straight to phase three, so that's straight to theater, as it is likely that the bowel is gangrenous and may have perforated. Here is a loop of sigmoid colon along with its mesentery. The volvulus has been reduced, leaving a very long, baggy and dilated sigmoid colon. Now, the purpose of the surgery is to remove the sigmoid colon, so emergency surgery for sigmoid volvulus is laparotomy and sigmoid colectomy. Here, we ligate the mesenteric vessels and resect the sigmoid colon. If there is doubt about the viability of the bowel, or if there is gangrene or frank peritonitis, then if we were to join the two ends together in a primary anastomosis, there would be a high risk of this leaking. So in this case, we would probably bring out an end colostomy. With the distal end, we could close this off and drop it back into the abdomen, or perhaps leave it somewhere we could find if we were to ever consider reversing this in the future. Alternatively, we could take this distal end and bring out a mucous fistula. Now on the other hand, if there are no signs of bowel ischemia, in a clean field, it might be reasonable to attempt a primary anastomosis after resecting the sigmoid although you can never eliminate the risk of an anastomotic leak. You also need to consider, however, how your patient will cope with the alternative of a stoma. If you have managed to decompress your patient's sigmoid volvulus through sigmoidoscopy, I'm afraid it doesn't end there. With mortality from an episode of sigmoid volvulus at around 10 to 15%, and a recurrence rate that is very high at around 70%, we therefore need to consider how we might go about reducing this risk of recurrence rather dramatically. Currently, sigmoid colectomy can get this recurrence risk down to below 5%. However, there are also non-resectional options that I don't think you need to know all that much about unless you are going to become a colorectal surgeon. These non-resectional techniques include colopexy, so that's anchoring the colon to try to stop it from twisting. There's percutaneous endoscopic colopexy, which is when a colonoscope is used together with a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy kit to anchor the sigmoid to the anterior abdominal wall. And lastly, I'll mention mesosigmoidoplasty that some have advocated, which is about reconstructing the sigmoid mesocolon in a certain way. Suffice to say that evidence isn't all that solid for any one of these techniques, but in general terms, resectional techniques carry the lowest risk of recurrence, but a higher risk of mortality when compared to these non-resectional techniques. So non-resectional techniques may be best served to very unfit patients where sigmoid colectomy is deemed excessively risky. Whilst the risk of mortality with sigmoid colectomy may indeed be around 10%, many of these patients are very frail, and so it really is all about patient selection. Sigmoid volvulus tends to happen in frail patients who often have a lot of other problems. So there are going to be many patients who don't do all that well with this condition. If you have managed to successfully decompress your patient's sigmoid volvulus with a sigmoidoscope, the risk of the volvulus recurring is high as you haven't dealt with the underlying anatomical problem. If your patient needs emergency surgery, then he or she has a high chance of dying from the condition with mortality estimated from 35% and upwards. And if in the theater there's gangrene or perforation, then it might be 50-50 as to whether your patient makes it out of hospital alive. But at the end of the day, 
These are just numbers. A patient's prognosis will be heavily influenced by their general fitness and level of comorbidity. Well, who knew there was so much to say about sigmoid volvulus? In this tutorial, I've gone over the anatomy and hopefully demonstrated that a sigmoid volvulus is a twist that causes a closed loop obstruction and may progress to gangrene and perforation if not dealt with rapidly. In the developed world, many patients are elderly and other risk factors include chronic constipation and neurological or psychiatric disorders and their associated medications. Taking a history should focus on determining the diagnosis and whether or not there is likely to be gangrene or perforation. Typically, a patient complains of absolute constipation and abdominal bloating with or without nausea and or vomiting. On examination, your patient is likely to be very distended. Evaluate their fluid status and note whether or not there are signs of sepsis and or peritonism. If I'm not sure of the diagnosis or I want more evidence that there's no ischemia or perforation, then I need a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. In managing your patient, you need to first resuscitate and you may wish to place a nasogastric tube and then your patient should either undergo sigmoidoscopy or laparotomy. Laparotomy and sigmoid colectomy are indicated if there are signs of gangrene or perforation or if sigmoidoscopy doesn't work. In theatre, if there is gangrene or perforation, the patient will probably end up with a stoma but if there are no signs of gangrene or perforation, then the surgeon will consider a primary anastomosis. In this tutorial, we also mentioned the high recurrence rate of sigmoid volvulus in those who have undergone only sigmoidoscopic decompression. And so their fitness should be assessed and consideration made for either resectional or non-resectional options to reduce this risk of recurrence. Sigmoid volvulus carries a high risk of mortality and it needs to be dealt with rapidly in the acute setting. I hope you now feel much more confident both in terms of answering exam questions, being quizzed by your seniors on the ward and in being able to help manage real patients with sigmoid volvulus. Now have a go at the multiple choice questions at www.boxmedicine.com. I'm Danny, bye bye.